Our text for the morning from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, the section near the end of the chapter. Listen to God's word as it comes to us this day, uh, a living word by the power of God's spirit. And Jesus is speaking here. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, word made flesh, So break open that word in our midst as we ponder it that we might become more and more like you, we pray in your holy name. Amen. It's it's helpful to know with all this bread language what happens earlier in in this chapter, and and that's one of the one of the descriptions of the feeding of five thousand with a with a few loaves and some fish. this miraculous feeding of this massive crowd of people. And, and if you know about the story, you may, you may also know that there's a crowd there that after seeing that happen, Jesus feeding all these people, they, they, they want to make Jesus their king and then figure out how to, if you will, commercialize this multiplication of, of bread. In other words, there may be a sense that they want to reduce the gospel to political power and food distribution. Jesus has something different in mind. He is much, much more radical than what they are perceiving and much more personal. I am the bread of life, he says as they're pondering this great miracle of the feeding. Anyone who comes to me will will never hunger. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will abide in me and I in them. Now, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I, I grew up on what seemed to me a rather sterile, typically Presbyterian communion ritual. Very neatly, uh, uh, perfectly cubed pieces of white bread. I mean, everyone looked absolutely identical to the one next to it. And tiny little glasses, glass glasses, with thimble full of grape juice in them. Communion did not happen often in the church in which I grew up. I think quarterly. That was the minimum requirement of the denomination, and that's about as far as we went. When it did happen, it was men in dark three-piece suits in this very carefully orchestrated movement distributed the trays through the sanctuary. My favorite things about communion, watching the reflections of the shiny brass trays dance around the ceiling in sort of this ad hoc ballet. And and, and then the the next favorite thing was the, the moment of the ritual's conclusion when all the people in the sanctuary 
almost at the same time place their little glass cups in the holes in the wooden pew racks. And there was this cacophony of clunking, clunk, 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 all through the sanctuary. And it, I thought it sounded so funny when you knew it wasn't supposed to sound funny. But I realized when I read this text this week, we, we never, as far as I remember, used these words from the Gospel of John about flesh and blood. It was always one of the other Gospel versions. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Not John's Eucharistic language. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. I can imagine as a young kid that would have sounded really odd. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. You will abide in me, and I will abide in you. Perhaps interpreted in its most crude form, as, as Jenny said with the children, this text, text declares, you, you are what you eat. Now, you know, I... I mean, that, that does sound a little absurd to us. We may laugh when we hear that you are what you eat, uh, you know, until, until we get our cholesterol numbers back from the annual physical. Mr. Lincoln, you've been having too much saturated fat. You have become what you eat. It was interesting when I was doing some research for last week's uh, closing class in the Apostles' Creed, and, and one of the phrases at the end, the resurrection of the body, I discovered something I had never known before, that the, that the stuff, the stuff of our bodies, the, the material stuff of our bodies is fully replaced about every seven years. You are not the same person you were in 2008. still you, but it's a new you. I thought about that for a while. I tried to think about what my diet was over the last seven years. I'm, hmm, <laughs> it's, you know, disturbing as, as well as maybe comforting, which is exactly what we ought to think when we hear these words of Jesus. Those, those who eat my flesh and, and drink my blood Abide in me, and I in them. For many years of my life, communion was, was a, a, a spiritualized thing. That is, that is not the image of this text here. It's very, very physical. Something happens, Jesus says, when you and I take in this bread and this cup, this flesh and blood of Jesus. Now, you may or may not know that, but, but we, we who are trained theologically and scholars and biblical professors, theologians, get, get really, really wound up when they try to describe the mechanics of what happens at this table. Churches and traditions have argued for centuries about what takes place here, what takes place in, with, through, around these elements. Let me, let me just say this today. We, we, have, we have wasted far too much time trying to unpack the mystery of what happens here and far too little time taking Jesus at his word. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Do you hear that? In, in, in other words, you and I become what he is when we eat here. The more we eat, the, 
the more he promises to abide in, be at work through, be alive in you and me. By taking him in, you and I run the risk of becoming more and more like him. Do you hear that? It's, it's no wonder some of us only wanted to do communion quarterly. Don't want to become too much like Jesus. As often as you and I eat this bread and drink this cup, the apostle Paul says we proclaim his death until he comes. Well, I, I, I want to say we not only proclaim, we become his life and his death until he comes. My friend Anna Murdoch tells her own sort of communion history, if you will, in a brief story. Listen, listen to her words. The brass tray was, was held briefly in front of the little girl. Her dimpled hand reached out for the most perfect cube of bread she could see. It was, it was such a tiny bite. And she tried carefully to, to lift a small glass cup filled with grape juice from the next tray, but she did it again. She, she tapped the cup against another one, and it made a little clinking noise that turned her father's head toward her. It reminded her of what she had always been told, that she was never, ever really a very careful child. She tried to drink the little bit of grape juice, but always, it seemed, there was always a little bit left in the bottom. She never felt nourished, never satisfied, and before she sat down, she had forgotten the taste of the bread and the juice. Later, there were times in the little girl's life when it seemed too hard or too much to come to eat and drink. There were other times when she just dreaded having to go through the motions. There were times when the bread was no more than a tasteless wafer stuck to the roof of her mouth. There were times when it was too hard to eat something that seemed not palatable and drink something that did not quench her thirst. But the little girl who, who felt as if all things were too hard and too much, who always tried to be careful and wasn't relaxed as she grew older, the little child who yearned to do everything just right, who wanted to remember the taste of the bread and the juice is now a woman who smiles when she remembers her mother's words, you are what you eat. Those may have been meant to be scolding words, but they became words of life. And now she rips off a hunk of bread and soaks it in the juice of the chalice. It becomes as messy as a child might be. And if the juice drips on her hand, so be it. And if she must chew on the bread on her walk back to the pew and chew even more after she's already sat down, that's okay too. For she has grown into savoring the moment. Smelling the juice. Tasting the bread, feeling the stickiness on her hand, seeing crumbs on the floor, and remembering that none of it is all about that being so careful, messy. She knows it may be too hard for some and, and may be routine for others, but her silent prayer is that she might become more and more and more of what she has eaten. Anna Murdoch is a, a layperson in a Methodist church in Statesville, North Carolina. His family, his work to do. But she writes and posts regularly on a site where preachers like me read her words and are fed. 
a lay volunteer who has become the Word made flesh. Jesus abides in her. And because of that, she feeds me. That's what Jesus promises happens here. It's what he intends with you and me to abide in us, to live in us in all of his self-expending, self-emptying ways for the sake of the world. So, sisters and brothers, we are, we, we are what we eat. <laughs> if you and I dare. Yeah, this is the place that feeds our deepest hungers, but it, it is not just food for our journey, a satisfying spiritual sustenance for us alone. This is where the living Christ comes to live in you and me, to live through us, that you and I might in turn be broken open into the world. We are what we eat, that the world might know the word made flesh, even in us. May it be so. Amen.